Welcome everyone to another Empathy Week webinar and session. I am so excited to have Jo Berry with us today. Jo, I talk about Jo all the time, she doesn't believe me, but I talk about Jo all the time when I talk about empathy because for, for me, she is the epitome of empathy in action. She's lived her life um, using that word and, and actioning it in, in a real sense. And I'm not gonna give her story away because it is just so powerful. Um, and I'm so glad she's here today because she's not actually feeling that well. Um, and she said, no, I'm going to make sure I come. So we've got a quick half an hour here. There is a Q&A function. I'm sure you're going to want to ask questions um, to Joe. So do uh, ask a question if you would like to, to Joe. Um, and she's obviously an amazing Empathy Week ambassador as well. So I'm going to be quiet because I want you all to hear Joe's really moving, powerful story of of her life um, and the, the circumstances that she's had to live her life in. And then we'll have a few questions as well. So Joe, thank you so much for being here um, and over yeah. to you. Oh, thank you, Ed, for the amazing introduction. And I just hope my voice will last. <laughs> very, very happy to be here. And empathy is something that I do think about and care about every single day. So absolute honor to be speaking on Empathy Week. So my story, it starts a long time ago. Um, when I was 27, I heard that a bomb had gone off at a hotel in Brighton. And I knew that my dad, who was a conservative MP, was staying at the hotel. And by the end of that day, it's October the 12th, 1984, I heard that my dad had been killed and my stepmother badly injured and that the IRA were responsible. Now, the IRA um, at that time in the 80s were planting bombs um, around in, in London and England, but I lived in peacetime. You know, I, I never, even though my dad was a, was a politician, it never occurred to me that he could be at risk. So not only was the shock of losing my dad, who I adored and was really close to, but it was how it happened. You know, I couldn't stop thinking that it was a bomb, a bomb. The, there were people there who had decided to plant the bomb and kill my dad and um, well, the whole conservative government. And I felt like I was suddenly feeling the pain of war. So two days later, I was so full of, of the loss and the shock and thinking about how it happened. And I made a, a silent vow. I'm going to bring something positive out of this. I'm going to find a way to bring peace to this violence. I'm going to find a way to actually understand those who killed my dad because I didn't want an enemy. For the last few years, I've been thinking about peace and I believed that we created peace by inner peace before this happened. But now that was completely irrelevant because I was now in a world where people, people chose to kill. And so this journey started and it was a journey where I gave up revenge, gave up blaming and became curious. Now, at the time, the media was full of demonizing the IRA. You know, they were given labels. And that, that didn't help me. That didn't help me understand. Because I knew that no 10-year-old would decide when they were 18 to join a paramilitary organization. So how was I going to hear the story? But somehow I just trusted that life was going to bring me the experiences. And very soon all sorts of serendipity, miracles happened. I ended up sharing a taxi with a complete random stranger who was from Northern Ireland. And because he had a voice, I knew he was from Belfast, his accent, I asked him, I'm on a, an unusual quest. I'm trying to understand why would someone join the IRA? Do you, do you know? And he said, no, that's not a strange question because my brother was actually in the IRA, but he was killed last year by a British soldier. And this is the height of the troubles. And we should have been enemies. We represented different sides. So his people killed my dad and my, my people killed his brother. But we weren't enemies. We spoke of a world where peace was possible, where nobody got demonized, where nobody killed. And I remember leaving that taxi and thinking, I can build a bridge across the divide. And even though no one knows, <laughs> I know. And that felt like 
the beginning of something huge. And I did travel a lot to Northern Ireland in 85 and 86 and met many people who welcomed me with open arms, shared their stories. But it was only with the peace process that my life changed again. And that was when the only person who was ever in prison for planting the bomb, Patrick McGee, he, was, he came out of prison early as part of the peace process. And I was, I remember seeing him on the TV. I wasn't prepared. No one told me he was going to come out of prison. And my first thought was, well, that's not fair. How come he's free? My dad can't come back. This isn't just. But then I thought, this is for peace. This means less people are going to be killed. And, you know, I've been feeling the pain of everyone who'd been killed from the moment my dad had been killed till that moment. So I welcomed the peace process for sure. And that's when the idea came to me, maybe now we have the peace process maybe I can meet him and it took a year and a half and it took a lot of a lot of courage and difficulty because a lot of people told me you mustn't do it don't meet him told me I wasn't ready told me he didn't want to meet me but eventually it happened in uh, 2000 in November and looking back I'd done my risk assessment I knew that he'd given up violence he'd, he was now believing in the peace process you know I knew that he would come with a lot of political justification. I knew he was intellectual, got a PhD in prison. And I knew that I didn't need him to say sorry. That was quite clear to me. I wanted to meet him, not to change him, but to look into his eyes and see him as a human being. Hear some of his stories, see some of his humanity, put a human face to the most horrific labels he had, because at that time he was the most demonized terrorist we had because he knew he killed the whole British government and Maggie Thatcher. And I remember him walking into the room and this is not a prepared environment to do this, this meeting. This is someone's kitchen in a sub suburb in Dublin and it's quite chaotic. There's people coming and going, phones going. So as he arrived, I remember getting up and I shook his hand and, and I thanked him for coming. He, he thanked me for inviting him. We went to a little room at the side of the house, just the two of us on a, on a sofa. I remember looking at him and thinking but you don't look like my idea of a terrorist and another voice in my head joe what are you doing here leave now this is betraying your father you shouldn't be here just go now while you can but i stayed because what i really wanted was to be present to him i wanted to find out who was he beneath the labels so i listened to him and i acknowledged what he'd been through i actually written a poem for him which i shared I remember when I read the poem, he was very moved. And he's talking about, for him, it was a strategy. It was a political strategy in order to enable what they had now, which the talks and the peace process. So he's sort of saying that it kind of worked. And for me, it didn't work. You know, I, I lost my father, who I adored, the trauma still going through it. Um, so no, that was hard. But I did look into his eyes and saw that he cared. He cared for his community. You know, it wasn't, yes, it was out, it was out of revenge. It, it was a way he, he was he was choosing violence, but he wanted to protect his community. Now, for me, that's never going to work. I don't believe we protect communities for using violence. But I saw that he cared. So he's now a human being with a story. He talks about his children. He talks about some of his personal parts of his life. And so I got what I wanted from that meeting, which was, just seeing him as a human being and I thought I can go now no one will ever know I've met him no one knew I'd gone and no one would ever know and I'd done something I'd empowered myself to have this meeting and when I was about to end it that's when he stopped talking and he said Joe I, I don't know anymore who I am I, I I I don't know um tell me can I hear your anger and your pain and what can I do for you? And I knew in that moment he'd taken off the political hat and what had just been my need to meet him now became his need to meet me. And so I stayed, even though it was actually very scary. And he asked a lot about my dad. And I began to realise that he was now seeing my dad as a human being as opposed to this horrible legitimate target. He wanted to know the impact on my life of losing my dad, the kind of man my dad had been. And he would later say that he was disarmed by my empathy, which surprised me because the me that was there 
who didn't have great self-esteem, did not have great intellectual abilities, but I had the ability to disarm him by that listening and being present, and it surprised him. And so he started his journey. And after another hour and a half, I couldn't, I couldn't listen to him anymore. I'd reached my limit. And so I said to him, I'm going to go now. Thank you. And he said, I'm really sorry I killed your father. Now, I didn't want that or need an apology. But what I got from that was he now sees my dad. And that was what grew of that first year. Because we did, I did go back a second and a third and a fourth time because we started something that was, I couldn't leave it. I just felt I had to go back. And, you know, he would say he now sees my dad as a man with a soul. And that now for him, the cost of his violence, he lost some of his humanity. He sees that. And it's the, the feeling that he now knows that he killed a wonderful human being. That's much harder than just having this kind of cold, just a strategy. So we've been together giving talks and it's been 22 years you know, and um, we're going to be speaking in a school soon, which he, we don't do very much together anymore. But I'm grateful to him for his engagement. And I think that it's been challenging, maybe more challenging for him than, than for me, because I think for him, the more he knows me, the more he knows the impact of what he did, the more he knows what he actually did do. He arrived without any problems and he's left with a huge amount. But for me, it has been learning about empathy. I remember early on we were being filmed for a documentary and we went off and to the Wicklow Mountains outside Dublin. We were just walking and talking and, you know, he was sharing so many experiences of what he'd been through. And I reached a point in me where I wondered if I'd lived his life, would I have made the same choices? And I don't know. I don't know. I might have. And then I had that same experience with the next British soldier and the next lawless paramilitary. It's like three sides to the conflict in Northern Ireland. And these three men have all used violence in different ways. And I could have been all their sister. I could have been them. And when I have that ability to open my heart, let go of judgment and really hear those stories, then there are no sides. It's not like one side is right and one side is wrong. And I think that ability to hear people with different sides of the same story, you know, has helped me in all my work that, that I do. And I don't think I could have learned it any, any other way. And there are many, many other things that um, I've learned through this, this process, but I wanted to focus um, before we open up to questions on the, the empathy, the ability to empathize. But it, to me, I have to let go of something in me. The, the me that wants to still be right. I'm like, I'm so right. I don't want to hear you. And I still have that sometimes in me. You know, the me that wants to, how could you do that? I wouldn't have done it. That's not empathy. Empathy is letting go of my need for revenge, my need to judge and just open up and to listen. It's going to take a drink. Joe, just whilst you're having a sip and resting your voice, I'm just, I've got goosebumps again. And I've, I've seen you talk a few times now and I feel so privileged yeah. too. Um, we've got a question coming in and I'm, I'll, let, I'll let you finish, Joe, on the bit about empathy, but please do ask a few more questions because we'll, in a couple of minutes, we'll, we'll go to those. Um, but Joe, sorry, you were saying about empathy. what you've learned from empathy, yes. Yeah. Yes, that it's, um, it's an active process. You know, it's something that um, I have to also look after myself. You know, there have been times when I've spoken with Patrick and it's been really challenging. You know, he has occasionally moved back into the political justification. And there are always good reasons why, but I might not see it at the time. <laughs> you know, I, I can get scared, I can get angry, you know, and I have to then give myself lots of empathy. Now, I didn't know. 22 years ago about giving myself empathy giving myself kindness I just didn't uh, there was, that was a whole new thing for me and I think for me to give empathy to the people I give in the world you know I have to look after myself and give myself that empathy and understanding and it's not about perfectly giving empathy <laughs> it's like it's not at all um because sometimes it's it's just not possible because of what I'm feeling 
but he's been an incredible teacher for me to let go of that need to blame. And I don't know what the opposite of empathy is, a dispathy, but for me, it's it's the making someone else responsible for our pain, making someone else the reason why our life is difficult. And when we're doing that, we can't give empathy. <laughs> we can't because we've given our power away. And actually giving empathy is, for me, it's taking the power back. It's, it's actually a very empowering thing to do. And it's a way of um, finding a way to bring something positive out of what, what has happened. And you know, when I go into schools, one of the messages I really want to get across is this whole idea that, yes, young people have inherited a difficult world, lots of grievances, injustice, all sorts of things, fears. And yet that can all be turned around and they have a voice and they matter and they can make a difference in the world. And that's one of the messages that I really like to get across. And quite often I work, I work with young people to create their own projects. And to me, that is a way of developing empathy. Um, they, I think they feel seen by my story and they feel heard. And then through that, then they can be, they, they can then take a step to empower themselves to be positive change makers. So for me, the whole thing is connected. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing, Joe. And, I love what you said there about um, empathy and understanding yourself and understanding it's okay to feel the way you feel. And we had a session this morning for, for younger students about identifying our emotions and that they're not bad. It's just about identifying them yeah. and understanding why you feel those. And obviously when you've experienced um, a trauma like you have, and I, I thank you again, because I know that every time you give this story, it's not just you're recounting a story. This is about your father and it brings up emotions in you. So thank you very much. For sharing that with us today um and we've got some questions coming in now um we've got a right. school in san francisco over in the us they've oh. asked um uh they've asked two, a couple of questions so the first one i think is more of a factual one um which i've also put some information about who the ira are because oh yeah of course they wouldn't know different, yeah. from different um countries but they've just said what were the consequences surrounding the events of the ira bombing involving your father so I, I guess that maybe that maybe means the consequences for the country, but maybe also for for Pat and for yourself. Um, yes, I mean it's it's uh, it's so far removed from the terrorism we have now around the world, so it's hard for people to remember what it was like. But I mean, for me as a young person, the um, I grew up with stories about the IRA the news was always about the conflict and after the bomb went off there were the news for years afterwards had pictures and there was always there the picture of the hotel it's like I couldn't get away from it you know so there it was again for whatever reason because the prime minister nearly got killed so that that just shows that how you know how huge it was at, at that time and it still gets talked about you know even now um the, I can't really give a history of the of the Northern Irish conflict, but that but it's it's something that even now people are working very very hard to protect the peace because there's there's been challenges even recently, but the people in in Northern Ireland are incredible how they've created so many grassroots peace building projects bringing together two communities Protestants and Catholics and it's it's amazing so and I feel very much part of that conflict you know was before the bomb went off I felt quite detached because most most of the pain and suffering was on the island of Ireland it, there, there mm. were bombs in London and I did sometimes um, find I couldn't get to school but it was something that I felt very detached from so that really changed for me yeah and you're you're right about saying you know although it's been so many years it's still there's still a fragility about um that 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 conflict and and the border yeah. and everything that's happened with brexit and even yeah. a few days ago a police officer was um exactly. was was shot um in, in an ira incident so there are still remnants of yeah this. so the peace building process isn't something that's just gone away it's still very much present i think you're you're, you're a great yeah. for that. Um, yeah We've, we've had but what's what's in common with all conflicts, isn't it? Is that that people people get killed and and people kill, and therefore the there's something universal about my story as well. It, so it doesn't have to. People don't need to know the exact Irish like the the roots of the conflict in order to identify 
with it because I think it can be applied to so many different conflicts around the world or gun shootings in America or whatever. So. Hmm. I've had a question from Margarita who who's um, asked, do you think that the shame and the guilt um, for Pat started the process when he talked about a strategy? Um, I think this is a comment to maybe to where, when you said that Pat sometimes falls yeah. back on talking about political strategy. Um, yeah. But was but was empathy when was it empathy when he moved to talking about seeing your father, or was it empathy that he got moved to? So I don't quite understand. But was empathy when he moved to talk about seeing your father? So I think the question is asking: did, did yeah, the shame and the guilt that maybe makes? Did, do you think that makes Pat fall back on the? The reasoning the when he talks yeah. about the strategy and then how the empathy is what he moves to empathy when you start talking about your father did you, do you see that even now when you talk to pat that's a very interesting question so before he met me i would say he just wasn't feeling any of it um and i think the so shame is something that he doesn't like to talk about and wouldn't he doesn't see it as part of his life at all um i i do believe from speaking to many people who've who crossed a line through using violence or we've not even crossed the line just started on the spectrum the shame is a huge part of the of the whole experience um and how to heal from shame i think is one of the hardest things to do and i think it is healing for him otherwise he wouldn't keep on coming back <laughs> and you know i know i just have to mess message him and he'll he'll want to meet me or you know occasionally he he can't at the moment he's not doing any media for all sorts of very good reasons but he'll want to be there because I think he, he gets something out of it I think he does get that sense of I'm part of him restoring his humanity so he lost something when he used violence and the restoration and not, not just me there are other people as well and other places he's been to and like he, he whenever he meets people who are involved in the conflict either from the Protestant side. We were all together in Milan in Italy recently, and he went off with the two guys who'd been part of his equivalent on the Protestant side. Mm -hmm. And I think that was part of him connecting to something as well. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I really believe that the journey back from using violence is so difficult that we have to let people know that before they do use violence, that if any other way to sort out their grievances because it's really hard whether people can fully regain their humanity from it and let go of that shame you know I really don't know and one of the things I do when I go into schools and it's usually the boys but not always who say oh you should have killed him Joe <laughs> they're very honest like, oh why didn't you just kill him back I would have killed him you know and, and that's where I bring in my empathy and I go yeah, that's that's a human response. You know, that is a human response. I, I get that. I understand that. I've had a part of me that's wanted to hurt him sometimes. I understand. And then I, I ask, so let's just imagine that's what happens. What happens then? Mm. And what happens then? And what happens then? And get them to really think all the consequences of what would happen. And I remember what, one boy after doing that, after like five minutes, and in fact, he kept on coming back and asking more and more questions. And the teacher was getting frustrated. I was like, no, this is really important. And at the end, he was like, okay, next time I feel like I want to hit someone, I'm going to take a breath. <laughs> and it was lovely, you know, because that, that, was, that was where he, he needed to go, you know, because it is, we all have that instinct, I, I believe, to hurt each other. Mm -hmm. And... But there was a guy who I was speaking to who was part of a conflict in, in Myanmar and he'd been through so much and he's he just said I just don't think I can give up revenge and I said you know giving up revenge feels like stopping gravity sometimes like that's how hard it is and he was like oh yeah yeah that's true you know and even that giving him empathy for that you know like not judging him because I don't judge people for that I like, know help I think helped him to, to maybe to have a bit more space some spaciousness around mm. yeah I think what I I always learn from your story and I'm sure other people do as well is that to pause on your initial innate reactions that you might feel and also you know there isn't any harm that comes from understanding actually usually it's good things that come from that but yet we always seek to try and 
act before we understand and I think that's the, that's the key element for us and when we define empathy we talk about you know allowing someone else creating space for someone else to be their their true self and reserving judgment and understanding them through that process and that's really what is what you've done with Pat and I'm, I'm conscious of time um, and we've got a, a nice little comment and question from um Elon has just he's just asked um I would like to thank Miss Joe for sharing um and just asking that just asking a short question saying you know so is empathy key do you think empathy is the key for forgiveness <laughs> I think empathy is the key <laughs> and some people like to use word forgiveness and some people don't and that's absolutely fine but I think empathy is the key to changing how we experience um, difficult things in the world. And there's so much demonization happening. There's so much uh, people feeling less than who they are. And to me, empathy is a way of like that empowering, that, that listening, empowering ourselves. And I call it unbounded empathy sometimes because it's easy to have empathy with the people we agree with and who are like us, who look like us. <laughs> but that's not what it's about, is it? It's about actually empathizing with those that maybe they do something that hurts us you know it's not letting them off the hook people sometimes think if you and I've been accused of that a lot you know I betrayed my father and I've, I've had a some very negative criticism about what I've done a lot um which is fine because that you know that's that's how we've always done things you know you don't speak to your other you don't speak to the enemy you don't have empathy for the other that's wrong that's very much what we're kind of told in our in our society and I've gone well actually that doesn't work <laughs> let's try something different <laughs> you know let's have empathy um and, you know and what I love most about the work I do with Pat is that when people say to me now I know what's possible I'm going to take this into my life and I'm going to have this conversation with someone who I haven't been having the conversation with and that gives me a lot of sense of yes that the young me wants to bring something positive out of this. And that's that's an amazing way. And, it's, and I feel it's an honour when people say that to me. Amazing. And, and Joe, you're going to like this next bit then. And I think this this will tie us up nicely, but I'll let you respond to it as well. We've had Macron from, from Lebanon um, say, in Lebanon, what you're preaching resonates a lot with us, especially about the civil war that went on from 1975 yeah. to 1990. When I read about it last year, I read a book that retells the events of the war from the um, point of view of five different parties and sides. This talk with you really opened my eyes to, to how there are different sides to every story and how communication and empathy is really key. So uh, we have someone in Lebanon watching Macron, thank you, who's, who's resonated with your story and resonated with the view, uh, you know, appreciating the sides of different people. And I think you know um what you've what you've talked about today your story uh, i put a link in the chat as well but there will be a link on the on this recording there'll be a button around that will, will link to building bridges for peace and more about your story um but it's so so powerful in a world where we see the news and we see suffering and we see hate and we see um demonization of enemies as well you know you're actually kind of preaching about understanding everyone involved to build that peace um, is there anything that you want to well, end on? Any, any last point of snippet of gold uh, that you can <laughs> give us to take into our own lives? Oh, well, well first of all, I send my support to the person in Lebanon. I, I was hoping to get back there. I've been there twice and I've heard stories from all the different sides. I love Lebanon. Absolutely love, love going there. And the suffering that people do experience is, is appalling. You know, and when when we you know, just imagine if our political leaders um around the world could have empathy for the people who didn't vote for them who had empathy for another country what would the world look like you know so rather than going well you're the baddies and we're the goodies and you're wrong and we're right but actually get curious and go so what's happening for you right now what do you need to feel safe what do you need to feel in your country you know let's listen let's hear each other it doesn't mean we're going to agree, but it means that we could create a solution that will work for everyone when we hear all the different needs rather than rush to war. And, you know, I know this is not, it's complicated and this isn't, this isn't like one simple way, 
but I do believe we can grow into a world where you know empathy is the way we and we have seen some politicians um like Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand I think the way she was after the terrorist attack she demonstrate most incredible empathy and there have been other leaders in the world you know and what would that what would that look like for all of us so that was more important to understand what interventions we can do before people use violence what is it that they they need that would then mean they wouldn't later on you know turn into being a terrorist what would it mean you know if we actually looked a solution that works for everyone and it's easy to to see that in a small group but i also think that empathy can be can be there for the, for the world and it's, i think it's necessary you know to create a sort of sustainable peace but back to ourselves, you know, let's start off by giving ourselves empathy and giving that that kindness and going, whatever's going on, you know, no, we're always doing our best and everyone's always doing their best because it's really hard to be a human being. And, and so to give ourselves that love and kindness and then I send my support and love to everyone. Amazing, Joe. Thank you so much. Um, as you just said, we're all human. We're all just trying to do our best. And let's all just try and understand each other that little bit more. Um, yeah. And then the world will change and your your small, the small area yeah. around you will change. And then that will affect the bigger area. And then hopefully we can have ripple effects from that. So exactly. Joe, thank you so, so much for being here, especially when you were, were feeling a little bit ill today as well. And you, you battled through uh, and being here for us. So thank you so, so much. And to everyone that's been watching, tuning in from across the world, I hope you've been inspired. I hope you've um, really seen how empathy can be put into action. It isn't something that's just soft and lovey and, and just no. hugging. It's, it's really hard and it's really hard to practice as Joe has said, and, and they're still practicing. So you're an inspiration to us all, Joe. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you everyone for watching and see you all soon. Thank Bye. you.